Venezuela went to the polls on Sunday to elect new members of the National Assembly. Up for grabs in the election are 277 assembly seats, 110 more from the previous legislature. While Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro cheered the election, opposition leader and National Assembly Speaker Juan Guado has announced a boycott of the vote. So what do Sunday's election mean for Venezuela's political future? Could it help ease the country's economic struggles, unemployment, scarcity of basic necessities, and now the COVID-19 challenge? Let's turn to our panelists. For more on the parliamentary election in Venezuela, joining us in Caracas, uh, Tamir Paras, who is a former Venezuelan Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs under Hugo Chavez. In Washington, D.C., Michael Shifter, President of the Inter-American Dialogue. And lastly, in Beijing, Jiang Shixue, Professor from Shanghai University, Vice President of the Chinese Association of Latin American Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, Mr. Shifter, now we know uh, observing from afar uh, that there are a hundred political parties participating, 14,000 candidates uh, uh, seeking 277 seats in the parliament. How do you look at the scale of the participation in a way politically and the different weights of the political parties? It's clear that the participation is low uh, as expected and uh, I think uh, no one's predicting a huge turnout and, and parliamentary elections in general don't have huge turnouts. Mm. Um, but it also was clear that the, you know, the major part of the opposition uh, boycotted this election and um, decided that there wasn't uh, conditions to make it a free and fair election and so uh, they did not participate. It's true that there were some uh, parties, smaller parties in the opposition that did, that, that have participated, but the vast majority decided that it was simply uh, not acceptable um, to have such a, a skewed playing field. And uh, of course, there was no international observation of the European Union, of the Organization of American States and the like. So, uh, of course, naturally, um, mm. the, uh, the result will be uh, uh, that the government will do very, very well and will have most of those 277 uh, seats. That certainly would be a very strong surprise if, it, if the result were any different than that. I see. Uh, Mr. Porras, uh, the legitimacy of the election that has been pretty much uh, reported uh, in uh, particularly the uh, European and the uh, U.S. press uh, uh, arguing uh, against it, uh, what do you make of that? And also the opposition leader uh, political views vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current president's uh, political party? Um, of course, the, uh, the U.S. government and most European governments will not recognize this election. And, and therefore, for instance, um, the matter of sanctions um, that have been um, um, imposed over Venezuela by the, by the U.S. government will remain after this. But internally, it's, it, it's a different story. Even though, again, there is not much enthusiasm about politics in general in Venezuela, given the, uh, the depth of the crisis, um, on the other hand, this is a country that requires some level of stability, some level of uh, institutional um, uh, normalcy, if you will. And the fact that a new national assembly uh, will uh, start functioning from, from January, one that uh, whatever its composition is not in conflict with the, uh, with the executive power, one that will vote the law or will discuss the budget, um, you know, even these general uh, matters that, that uh, have, have been absent from Venezuelan politics is a starting point. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, a, a beginning probably, uh, you know, to start reinstitutionalizing the country and, and, and probably reaching more agreements that will bring uh, much needed stability. Right. Uh, how do you look at, Professor Jiang, the priorities uh, once the election comes to a close and whether the election will be the start of a new stage of work for the peace and stability in the country or will be the start of another turbulent period for the country? Uh, regarding the possibility whether or not Venezuela will be come down or not, will be a, uh, a nice place for foreign investment, 
Well, uh, for the time being, no one knows that. At least uh, there are two possibilities. Uh, I think Maduro will be in a better position to control the situation in Venezuela if the opposition can cooperate, if the U.S. can stop intervening uh, uh, in the internal affairs of Venezuela. Talking about the U.S., uh, we see the end of the term for the current administration. Of course, uh, this current administration really tried to put its mark on politics uh, before they leave. Uh, how do you see from now until uh, January the 20th, uh, the current administration with a very unique president and certainly a secretary of state following every step of the way of that president trying to make their mark? And what would that mean for uh, Venezuela, uh, which... Uh, uh, many considers as a country that has been uh, impacted by heavy U.S. politics. To predict uh, exactly what our current president will do between now and uh, January 20th, but I would expect that he would continue with the very uh, tough, aggressive rhetoric against the Maduro regime. Um, I think a lot of the Venezuela policy under the current president was shaped by uh, Florida politics. The president-elect Biden, who will assume office January 20th, has said that Nicolas Maduro was a dictator of Venezuela. And uh, I think he will also have a, uh, a hard line, uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily um, uh, defined by Venezuela politics, but defined by the interests and the values of the United States. And he's, he's picked his foreign policy team and national security team uh, with a values uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And one of the values um, that he has reiterated is democracy and human rights. And uh, from all the accounts that we have from credible organizations like the UN and other organizations, there is a profound problem with democracy and human rights in Venezuela. How is Venezuela looking at the potential political relationship with the U.S., particularly with heavy sanctions still by the other side against your country? Well, it, it is well known that uh, Venezuela already under President Chavez and under President Maduro had always difficult relations with the, uh, with the United States. But in the recent years, in the last two years, um, this has escalated to a point, uh, an unprecedented point, with the um, imposition of, of very heavy sanctions. Uh, over the country, specifically uh, over its oil industry uh, that, that has affected Venezuela's economy. Um, I think that the um, Venezuelan government and President Maduro uh, has um, somehow um, given up uh, the possibility of improving uh, the relations with the, with the United States. I think there is a sense of um, relief that the uh, Trump administration is over, of course. Uh, the Trump administration had uh, pushed a, a regime change policy, saying that all options were on the table, even you know, uh, eyeing the possibility of a military intervention at some point. So there is a sense of, of relief and, 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 and happiness, if you will, in Caracas, uh, that the Trump administration has, is over, and that the new administration, even though, again, nobody expects um, the policy of uh, pressure over Venezuela to, to stop, that, that the new administration will have a more pragmatic approach and that there will be possibilities for dialogue between political actors in Caracas and political actors in, in Washington, uh, probably, you know, to, to um, um, resume uh, political dialogue and negotiations. And, and the idea that the Venezuelan crisis requires a national dialogue and the national negotiation and an, uh, an outcome out of negotiations and not from confrontation is probably a common ground that, that can potentially be found with the new incoming administration. But again, uh, the Venezuelan government um, is, uh, in my opinion, prepared to uh, continue trying to uh, find ways to, uh, to improve Venezuela's economy or um, in, improve Venezuela's life without uh, the, um, the U.S. sanctions being lifted. Yeah. This is a more 
you know, hopeful approach or, or mid-term approach, but not, not, not an immediate uh, expectation from... From the outside Paris. the country, we heard a lot about uh, the others' opinions, for example, of the U.S., of the European Union, but uh, we want to hear more about uh, within Venezuela, how people are articulating this. Uh, Mr. Porras, you are in the country. Tell me more about how do people see this 4,000% uh, inflation going on in the country uh, and a bad relationship with the neighbor of the United States. Uh, how is the country planning about its uh, economic recovery possible during the time of the pandemic? It seems to be one hurdle after another. What is the discussion going on there on the street about what is the way out? Uh, recently, there have been some efforts from, from the government uh, that has, in a way, uh, opened up its economic policy. Uh, it has allowed for a certain level of dollarization of the economy, which has uh, relatively stabilized or, or, or at least diminished the level of, of, of hyperinflation, uh, br brought hyperinflation to relative you know, levels of control. And, and apparently, again, the plans of the, of the government is to continuing um, an opening up process and, and, and giving more space for the national private sector and eventually for international private sector. But again, the issue of the sanctions prevents uh, most economic and financial relations uh, with the United States, with the European Union and with most Western uh, partners to right. resume or at least come back to the levels of 2013. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's still a, a, a very, um, a big challenge for the government to, uh, to uh, recover some level of economic stability. And what about the pandemic situation? Now we know the numbers are also skyrocketing as we speak. Uh, so do you have uh, within the country uh, a national system to tackle it? Secondly, do you have uh, a plan for vaccine, for example, uh, that are already on the agenda of quite some people, uh, some countries? Tell me more about the Venezuela situation, Mr. Uh, Perez. Well, uh, oddly enough, the pandemic in, in, in Venezuela has not um, uh, reached the same levels uh, that, for instance, it, 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 it reached in, in countries like Brazil or, or Peru, mm -hmm. uh, somehow because um, the, the level of mobility inside the country um, is, is, uh, has diminished uh, given the depth of the economic crisis. There is also a second factor that uh, Venezuela was relatively isolated uh, from its neighbors. You know, the level of incoming flights from overseas uh, has been reduced massively during the la last few years. Mm. And, and in a way also the, the fact that the, um, uh, the, the social base of the government um, is in uh, concentrated in the poorer areas and the level of social control, if you will, that the government exercises in Venezuela is higher than in the rest of the uh, Latin American countries, combined, by the way, with a, with a relatively high level of cooperation with, with China, allowed Venezuela relatively early to, uh, to deploy a strategy to prevent uh, the pandemic from, from reaching skyrocketing, skyrocketing levels. And, and in a way, it was um, the, the best fuel decision to make because the health system in Venezuela is heavily affected and has collapsed in some, some uh, of the regions of the country, uh, given again the general uh, level of, of, of uh, economic and social crisis. So what, what, what I could tell you is that the pandemic is not absolutely under control, but it hasn't um, gone as far as in some other uh, countries of the region, fortunately, once again, because the uh, uh, health system in Venezuela uh, would be uh, ill-positioned to, uh, uh, to absorb uh, a massive uh, number of, uh, of, of uh, ill people. Got it. Uh, uh, Professor Jiang,
Observing from afar, uh, we heard from uh, Mr. Porras talking about uh, the country is willing to invite more foreign investment, certainly, but also concern about its relation with the U.S. Uh, what other role could be, uh, Professor Zhang, particularly about China? I know a lot of Chinese uh, investment of uh, interest uh, in the country, given the country's uh, uh, rich uh, natural resources and the earlier cooperation between the two countries. But, uh, you know, what is that point? that investors in China, for example, look at and say, well, this is a place now I can invest, or this is a place I probably still have to wait. As Mr. Shifter earlier mentioned, the relationship within, uh, for the next administration uh, in the U.S. with Venezuela is not necessarily going to improve much uh, compared to the current situation. So, Professor Jiang, uh, how is uh, Chinese investors articulating this? Well, uh, as you know, China really wants to promote uh, uh, cooperation in terms of trade, investment, uh, and uh, in other aspects uh, with Venezuela. But uh, in the past uh, several years, uh, the whole situation is terrible. So it's very, very difficult uh, for China to have more economic cooperation with this uh, South American country. So I think uh, the most important job uh, for the Maduro uh, government uh, is to maintain political stability. Without a political stability, there will be no economic growth, so there will be no possibility for it to attract foreign investment. And uh, in order to maintain political stability, there should be a kind of a political dialogue between, uh, p uh, between the government uh, and the opposition. And also, let me mention again that uh, the U.S. and the other external uh, forces should stop intervening in the domestic affairs of this uh, uh, South American country. Mm. Mr. Shifter, is that uh, dialogue uh, mentioned by the other two uh, colleagues of yours uh, in the discussion possible? Uh, what do you see should be the most appropriate role for the U.S., uh, particularly the U.S. government, in making situations in Venezuela better, particularly for the common folks? I think ultimately um, more stability means having a political agreement um, among the, the, the government and the opposition. That's the only way that this profound crisis uh, is going to be resolved. And, um, and of course, that uh, requires um, that the government is willing to negotiate uh, in good faith and seriously. There have been previous uh, processes of dialogue and negotiation, um, but the, the but the government hasn't hasn't kept its word and hasn't negotiated in good faith with the Oslo process of the Norwegians, and so this has got to become more serious. And I think the Biden incoming Biden administration uh, would be committed um, to that process if the government really prepared to give some uh, concession so we can get an agreement and on the basis of that agreement, hopefully move towards elections that actually are free and fair. Uh, what would be the role of the U.S. in that regard? Uh, Mr. Shifter, do you see think, the U.S. will I play the, a, a constructive role or a, a role that's betting on one side and therefore making the oh. overall situation more tricky? Uh, what is likely to be the U.S. role? You see, I think the U.S. Can pl would play a constructive role. I don't only think only don't, I don't think it's the U.S. only. I think it's Europe, and I think it's the Latin American countries. I think it's China, and I think it's Cuba, and I think it's Russia. And you know, let's get all the players around the table. This is not a this is not a, a U.S. imposed solution. This is in order for this to work. Um, this is a global, global, uh, uh, this is a, a global issue. Mr. Shifter is talking about, let's make this work. But Mr. Porras, to you, what is this? Well, um, from, from my perspective, this uh, means coming back to the normal functioning of Venezuelan institutions as uh, uh, they, they, they are enshrined in the uh, Venezuelan constitution. Uh, which, uh, of course, is clearly not the case right now. Um, the the uh, political conflict between the government and, the, and its opposition, especially during the last two years, has taken uh, Venezuela down a path of, of confrontation, of polarization, of what I have called at some point in time, you know, a partition uh, 
of the Venezuelan state, sponsored uh, by, by the U.S. policy uh, in Venezuela, and with, with the hope, uh, seen from Washington, that um, the, the Venezuelan government and the Maduro presidency would collapse under the pressure. And, and as we have uh, witnessed during the last two years, uh, this policy has only um, made uh, an already complex situation worse and, and, and has uh, made uh, this crisis that was supposed to be uh, resolved through pressure in, in, a, in a matter of weeks, if we go back to uh, January 2019, when uh, the whole, you know, this phase of the crisis started, um, it was supposed to be resolved in a matter of weeks, and, and, and here we are, two, two years later, um, relatively in the same, in, in exactly the same situation, but with, a, with, a, with an economy that has been uh, destroyed and, 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 and affected more heavily. So uh, this means, again, a sovereign, internal Venezuelan solution uh, to its own crisis, of course, and I agree uh, in this point with, with Michael Schifter, uh, that, that needs the cooperation of the international community, of relevant actors, the United States, China, the European Union, Russia, he mentioned them, uh, mentioned them all, but they, they, they need to support a negotiated, an internal negotiated solution, not to impose a, a foreign-made um, solution. I got it. Uh, Mr. Jiang, uh, final words before we wrap up. Well, uh, yes, Michael's idea is good. We should sit down and have a talk. So let's say we can have uh, a kind of a six party or seven parties dialogue, like, uh, like um, uh, Venezuela, the US, EU, China, Cuba, Moscow, and other countries like Brazil or Colombia. So, uh, so we can have a seven party talk. But before the talk can start, the US should stop sanctioning Venezuela. Venezuelan people need food, need medicine, need all kinds of things. So the U.S. should stop sanctioning further and further. All right. We heard everybody's opinion. It's certainly going to be a situation that needs to be closely monitored and uh, looked into. Thank you so much for the three of you contributing your insights from different perspectives. Tamia Proras, Michael Shifter, Jiang Shishu. Really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. And be safe wherever you are. Thank you.